professional kids that started Food Out Bombs in uh, 1980. I was a produce worker and an art student in Boston and, uh, and a couple other things. And anyway, one of my professors was Howard Zinn and uh, he wrote a book called The People's History of the United States. And he would talk about these protests in New Hampshire against Seabrook nuclear power stations. So I started going up to those protests and on May, uh, the May 24th, 1980 occupation attempt of Seabrook, the, one of my friends was arrested. And so we started to raise money for his legal defense by doing bake sales at, uh, in the Boston Commons and things like that. And we really never made any money, of course. We made like five bucks a day, stuff like that, for all night baking. And we had another little business called Smooth Move. And we moved this family that was an a, a activist family, and they were throwing away a poster that said, wouldn't it be a beautiful day if the schools had all the money they needed and the Air Force had to um, hold a bake sale to buy a bomber? So we thought, well, that's cool. We bought some military uniforms, and we went, to, uh, um, went down to Harvard Square with our baked goods, and we told people we were trying to buy a bomber, and they were like, really? You look more like hippies in military uniforms, and people are trying to buy a bomber. And, but and it, anyway, it got people talking to us about why we were protesting nuclear power and nuclear, uh, the nuclear arms race. And um, then we were approached by a group of activists that were, had been, were working with us in Seabrook, and they had investigated the Bank of Boston, found out that the board members of the Bank of Boston were on the board of the Public Service Company of New Hampshire building Seabrook nuclear power station, and they were on the uh, board of Babcock and Wilcox that was building the station. And, uh, and they realized that basically the same s small number of uh, wealthy bankers in New England were taking our money and then investing it in their own behalf. So we decided to organize a protest outside the stockholders meeting of the Bank of Boston at uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, which is uh, actually now where the Occupy Boston has been staging their actions for uh, since uh, September. And uh, so we, as a produce worker, I was throwing away quite a bit of, of produce every morning. And uh, it was an, uh, the store was one of the earliest commercial uh, organic produce stores or, or grocery stores. And they were concerned people wouldn't buy organic if it didn't look right. So I would have five or six cases of great produce, just wasn't looking perfect or was wilted. And at first I was taking that to these housing projects a couple of blocks away. Um, and the projects were uh, across the street from this huge glass building where they were designing the guidance system for uh, intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles. And that was where we got our idea to call ourselves Food Not Bombs. But then with this action, we decided to take some of that produ produce and uh, make a huge pot of soup and dress up as hobos and go down to the stockholders meeting and have the uh, literature that, and signs that said the policies of the Bank of Boston uh, if they were to continue like this, could lead to a society where people would have to stand in line to eat at soup kitchens and that we could end up having another uh, economic collapse. And so the, after, as we were making this huge giant pot of soup, we got really worried we'd have this great meal, but not but eight or ten people to eat it. So uh, we went to the Pine Street Inn, which was one of the few shelters at that time in Boston, and I gave a speech to all the guys there. And the next day, about 70 people from, from the inn showed up. And because there weren't uh, lots of homeless people yet, because Reagan had only been in office like a year, and they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, the p business people walking by would go, what the heck is this about? So before long, we have business people and homeless people all hanging out eating. And we start getting the stockholders coming out for lunch, and they, some of them are eating with us and telling us how horrible the bank was. And it was this amazing day. So uh, that was March 26, 1981. So at the end, when we're washing up all our equipment, the pots and pans, we decided that we would just quit our jobs and do nothing but this. It was just so amazing. So I gave two weeks notice at Bread and Circus, my grocery, and we started to drive around a system 
where we would pick up discarded, uh, you know, we'd make arrangements with the bakeries and all the grocery stores and the food co-ops to pick up the food that they couldn't sell. And then we had arrangements to come to housing projects and deliver the food to people at these housing projects. And we took uh, food to Rosie's Place, the battered women's shelter, and some daycare centers. And then in the afternoon, we would go out to a Harvard Square and the Boston Commons and set up a literature table have our food and we also and before long we had uh, musicians hanging out with us so we had two full drum sets for uh, quite a long time that would play and get a crowd going we even uh, made our own little uh, movies about um, different political issues like the war in El Salvador or selective service was being proposed at that time there was the crisis in Iran with the hostage crisis stuff like that so we'd have all this like uh, um, literature and theater and little movies about those ideas. Then one day we're out there and this group of people show up and they have a big tent and they set up next to us and it says, um, uh, it says Pepsi Challenge or Take the Pepsi Challenge. And what they were doing was hiring college students to open bottles of Coke at night and then they would go out and you would stand in line, get blindfolded, and you would uh, have to see which was uh, Coke and which was Pepsi. So we had just received a bunch of little cups from a dentist that was retiring that were just the same as the Pepsi Challenge cups. And we had like a really good tofu uh, uh, hookup from White Wave Tofu and lots of extra fruit. So we started making tofu smoothies. And we came up with this idea uh, um, called Take the Tofu Smoothie Challenge. There's more nutrition in this one cup of tofu smoothie than all the Pepsi products on earth. It turned out also that we had moved the New England Free Press just before that, and they gave us all the flyers they could had overprinted. And one of the brochures was about how Coca-Cola hired death squads to kill labor organizers in Guatemala. So as everybody lined up to do the Pepsi challenge, and we were like, oh, take the tofu challenge, and uh, we'd hand them a brochure about death squads killing the labor organizers, and the people were like, whoa, this isn't like what we saw on TV. This is crazy. So we did that for like uh, until they eventually called the police on us. And, uh, and instead of arresting us, however, the police said, well, look, at Food Not Bombs has a uh, refrigerator at City Hall. They've already organized three marches with Cambridge City Council. I don't think you're going to get any luck getting rid of food up bombs. So unfortunately, they packed up their stuff and, and left, and we had to come up with other kinds of street theater to entertain ourselves and to attract attention to the cause of uh, ending hunger and ending poverty and war. So that's what we did in, in Boston for... In, um, then I was involved in that collective for eight years, and then in 1988, I moved to San Francisco. And this time, we decided we'd take notes on how we started the Food Not Bombs chapter. And we got a grant from American Peace Test to provide food for 10 days at the Nevada test site. And so the first thing we do is we go out there and, and, and serve food at the main gate of the test site while people were being arrested and people trying to occupy Mercury where the tests were being organized from. And people would go all the way out to the ground zero and, and camp out there to keep them from doing their nuclear testing. And these people come up to us and they're like, oh wow, we, um, we're doing a thing, we're giving away free food in Long Beach, California. But we, and we'd heard of Food Not Bombs, but we thought the name was copywritten, so we're calling ourselves Bread Not Bombs. We're like, oh no, change your name to Food Not Bombs, and then there'll be three groups. So they do that, and so suddenly we now have three Food Not Bombs chapters. And we go back to San Francisco, and we set up uh, at the entrance to Golden Gate Park every Monday, because there was uh, meals all the other days in the Haight-Ashbury, but no food on Mondays. And so we're having a great time with music again and, and all this uh, scene going on uh, from noon to three at Golden Gate Park. And one day this hippie comes by and he goes, oh, you can get a uh, permit for this if you write the Parks Department. So we're like, oh, that's so nice. So we write the Parks Department for our permit. And we occasionally go by and ask them if, they're, uh, if we're going to get a permit. But they don't really know what we're talking about. So then... One day, on August 15th of 1988, we get a, everything set up, we're handing out the food, and 45 riot police come out of the woods and arrest nine of us for serving food without a permit. 
So it turns out the police had told the media they were going to do this, or the San Francisco Chronicle. And so there's a big photograph of riot police guarding the food the next day. And a, and a headline, nine volunteers arrested feeding homeless at Golden Gate Park. So people start to call us up. How can we get arrested with you guys? This is so cool. <laughs> so we have a meeting real fast, and we decide that we would all set, we would set up, uh, we meet at the end of Haight Street, and we urge people to bring pots and spoons to bang. And so everybody marches down the street. One guy brought a painting he did of Spock from Star Trek, and we all get to the end, and we set up. And uh, this time, the police arrest 29 of us, and there was a new TV company, Cable Network News, that showed up. And they got video of this, and there was uh, other reporters. So there's news articles all over the world about 29 volunteers arrested feeding the hungry at Golden Gate Park. So now we're getting calls and letters from all over the world asking how they can organize a food not bombs group so they can get arrested feeding the hungry. So we decided to take the notes we made into a, and make them into a flyer called Seven Steps to Starting the Food Not Bombs. And so uh, we start mailing that to people and everything, and groups are starting to slowly start in other cities. Then the next week we show up, about 500 people come, and the police say, oh, we don't mind that you're feeding the hungry, it's that you're making a political statement and that's not allowed. We'll give you city buses, we'll take the homeless out to the armory at the beach and you can feed them in there but you can't be out here with literature and banners and stuff like that and so we like then uh, talk to the media after that and we say well we're really not a charity with 50 cents of every federal tax dollar going to the military that's clear that no one needs to be living in Golden Gate Park or eating in soup kitchens and that our goal is to change society so everyone has health care and education and a place to live and food to eat the next week is Labor Day, and about 2,000 people show up to get arrested, and the police give up after the first 54 arrests. And so um, then the next day, the mayor frantically contacts us, and we have a meeting with him, and he gives us a permit so he can stop arresting us. So now we have so many volunteers, we might as well do uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and now there's groups in Victoria, British Columbia, New York City, Washington, D.C., and that's this amazing scene. So then, the next summer, um, the police decide they're going to try to drive the homeless from San Francisco. And uh, so they, they come to us and they're expressing that they're really upset that they've been getting woken every night and told to leave. So they happen to read, read and see in the media that there are students uh, occupying Tiananmen Square in China. And so they decide they would go to City Hall, to Civic Center Plaza, and they would occupy that space and call it Tenement Square. So on the third day, they ask us to join them, and because they said, well, it's obvious we need food at this uh, occupation. So we, show, we agreed to bring them food, and we set up a 24-hour-a-day vegetarian restaurant in front of City Hall. And then every day when the mayor and the politicians came out of City Hall, there would be a homeless ballet or a homeless poetry readings and homeless uh, concerts. And there was this amazing cultural ex uh, event happening all the time. And we got our own portable toilets and we cleaned the park. We had to do our own trash pickup because the city called off trash pickup to the area to make it look like messy and everything. And this went on for 27 days when the mayor announced that he had a solution for the homeless of San Francisco. Everybody, with the help of riot police, we packed up all of our belongings and we moved to the new shelter at an abandoned Jaguar dealership. But when we got there, it turned out you had to leave your wife and children in the streets because it was only for men. You couldn't have your pets with you. You had to take them to the pound to be put to sleep. You could only have two shopping bags worth of belongings. And you could only, uh, uh, and you had to bring your own cardboard box to sleep on. There weren't mattresses or food. So we went back to Civic Center Plaza and set up lunch, at which point 16 of us are immediately arrested and all the food is taken. So we decided we needed a better plan. So for dinner, we divided the food into thirds. We came out with just a little bit of food and we handed that out, and a couple of volunteers were arrested. Then we came out with a little bit more food, and a couple of volunteers were arrested and taken away. And then, while the uh, captain of the department was like, oh, that's good, you stopped food, not bombs, way to go. We'd come out with all the rest of the food and feed everybody that showed. And there was about three, five, 300 to uh, 500 people showing each meal. 
And we do this for a month, and after we're getting really burned out. Wow, this is just like too much. So we start to do another program called Risk Arrest One Day a Month with Food Not Bombs. <laughs> so the first group to come out was a group of uh, nuns and priests, and they get arrested, and the cops pat down the nuns to make sure they don't have guns, because, you know, nuns with guns are quite dangerous. <laughs> <clears throat> and the carpenters union comes out and gets jailed and teachers groups get jailed and this goes on every day twice a day with like people being arrested sharing food at city hall and then we have this huge pots of soup ready to go you know we're preparing meals in uh, in a apartment in the richmond district and there's this huge earthquake and the electricity and gas goes off and we're like wow that's really intense well, well let's let's get the equipment we had from the occupation, go back down to City Hall, and probably the police will be busy dealing with the directing traffic and dealing with the earthquake, and it won't be a problem. So we get down there, and there's not only the normal people that we've been uh, sharing food with, but now there's like hundreds of more people, and all the grocery stores in town are now uh, delivering the produce that they know will go bad in their refrigerators and their walk-ins. So we go get another tent just to store the extra food. And this is going really good. We got all these, you know, it's like this huge event in front of City Hall. We're feeding all these, like, hundreds of people. And before long, more police vehicles arrive than we'd ever seen before. We're like, this is insane. Right after an earthquake, you're going to arrest us yet again. But instead of arresting us, they all got out of their vehicles and came over and stood in line patiently and had dinner. And they all came promptly at 9 o'clock the next morning for breakfast. And, and uh, they, they uh, came for three days. They ate all their meals at Food Not Bombs because there was just no other food in San Francisco to be had. <laughs> and so that wave of about 300 arrests inspired chapters in Melbourne, Australia, um, Prague, Czechoslovakia, um, uh, Brixton, England, all the major cities of Canada. Um, it was like it's just to inspired many, many more people to start chapters. So then we find out uh, that, that Chevron will be sponsoring the 500th anniversary of Columbus discovering the new world, and that San Francisco has been chosen as the official city to celebrate this wonderful event. And uh, Native people have a meeting in Arctic Circle, and they decide that maybe 500 years is enough. So, at around that same time, a publishing company in Philadelphia asked us to take the flyer, Seven Steps to Starting a Food Not Bombs, and to make it into a, a book, which we, was about to come out in early October, called Food Not Bombs, How to Feed the Hungry and Build Community. So, we decided to have the first Food Not Bombs gathering, and about 70 people show up on the, uh, the 9th of October, and we meet for two days, and uh, we decided that there would be three principles to Food Not Bombs. That the food would always be vegetarian or vegan and free to anyone without restriction, rich or poor, drunk or sober. That uh, there would not be any uh, uh, headquarters or presidents or directors or anything like that. That each chapter would be autonomous. And that they would uh, use the process of consensus to make decision and try to encourage the people eating with Food Not Bombs to participate in the, in the weekly meetings. And then the third uh, um, I, principle that we decided on was that we would be not a charity, but that we'd be uh, dedicated to nonviolent direct action to change society so no one would have to eat at a soup kitchen and that everyone would have a place to live. So then we made this huge amount of soup and all this other food, and we went down to Aquatic Park where Columbus was scheduled to land. This time, the elders of the Native American community decided 500 years was enough, and they pushed Columbus back out in the bay. <laughs> and then some Funa Bombs kids go to Columbus Avenue to the parade, and they steal the Nina, Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and they run through the city being chased by the Italian American Association. And then we have a big party. <clears throat> and then people take copies of the books, and we go and we start even more chapters. So then it was uh, uh, not long after that, the chief of police decided he would run for mayor on the anti-homeless ticket. And then if he was arrest, uh, elected, he would round up all the homeless people, put them in a work camp south of the city, and he'd even put a little sign over the entrance saying, work shall make you free. So, of course, he wins the election, and he starts his campaign called Quality of Life Enforcement Matrix Program.
And he gets two airplanes from the Justice Department with thermal imaging devices so they could fly up and down the parks and the streets and see the body heat from the homeless people at night, nowhere to round them up. And so, of course, they have one of the first raids turns out to be near where we're sharing food at City Hall. And we borrow a video camera from American Civil Liberties Union, and we videotape the police ordering the homeless to take their shoes off and throw them in the garbage trucks, to take their, confiscating their blankets and sleeping bags, um, animal control taking people's pets to the pound, and people being arrested for warrants or for being mentally ill. And we get video of a grandmother struggling with her photo album of her children, grandchildren as the police rip it out of her arms. And we take that video and we give it to the TV companies. And Oakland uh, Channel 2 shows it that evening. And the mayor is furious. It makes his uh, homeless uh, matrix program seem inhumane. So he goes to the uh, city attorney and he gets a, an injunction against us serving food without a permit. And he goes to the Parks Department and asks the, and orders them to delete the permit process. So shortly after that, we start getting arrested for felony conspiracy to serve food in violation of a court order. <laughs> so we start uh, dividing the food into thirds again. We call up the nuns and everybody, and they start doing risk arrest one day of a month with food not bombs. Now the nuns and the priests have a group called Religious Witness with Homeless People. And it's this amazing scene every day in front of City, city Hall. And uh, before long, we got an, uh, uh, a letter from the Coalition on Homelessness, and they suggest that Thanksgiving be a national day called Ho Housing Now. And so we decide, we find out that there's an abandoned hotel where low-income people have been living, but have been evicted to make room for a luxury hotel. And that hotel is right across the street from the soup kitchen where the mayor will come and cut turkey for his photo op for Thanksgiving morning. So we sneak into that building and we wait for the mayor to arrive. And when he comes, we hang banners out the windows. And one of them says, homes, not jails. And so that gives us this idea to go around the city, write down the addresses of the empty buildings, go to the tax office at City Hall, find out who owns them. And if it was just a family that didn't have the resources to keep up their building, we'd ignore that building. But in that time, it was the savings and loan crisis, which is like a miniature version of the current foreclosure crisis. And so there was lots of banks suing each other over mortgages on these empty buildings. So we would go and we'd put our own locks on these buildings. And at dinner, we'd make an announcement, does anyone want a free place to live? And you would be surprised how many homeless people want a free house. It is like so popular. 